Hi everyone, this is GKCS. We are going to be talking about Moore's algorithm now. And this is a very interesting algorithm because it doesn't use any data structure. It just uses some sort of common sense logic in a way to uh, reduce the overall complexity of our queries. So this is the problem. We have an array and we are supposed to perform some sort of range queries on it. So ranges from left to right will be given to us and we have to output something based on the array. So for example, uh, there's a spot problem of D query which we'll be picking up in this tutorial. So D query says that you have this array and you have Q queries of type left to right such that you have to give us the uh, all the distinct elements between left and right in this array. Alright, so for example, if you take uh, left as index 3 and right as index 7. So the number of distinct elements we have is 12. 16 is distinct, I haven't read that. 37 and 16 is already there and 12 was counted just once. So basically you have to create a set and you have to get the count of that set which is 3 in this case. So we have already seen the brute force approach in which you traverse the entire range and uh, that is in the worst case order n because we have q queries that goes up to n q right um, we are going to be using the same logic of traversing the entire range but in a in a different way so let's have a look at Mo's algorithm now all right look, you have these queries the very first query that you're going to get is going to be l1 and r1 these are the indexes and let's have two pointers of ourselves, which will be start and end. So start and end are going to be defining the range that we are in right now. And L1 and R1 are, is the range which has been asked uh, to be solved by us. Right, so start will first jump into L1. So start is initialized to L1. Uh, for example, if this is 3, 5, then start becomes 3, which means start starts pointing here. And end also is initialized to start. So end is also pointing over here. Both pointers are pointing here. Now, here's the thing. Start is going to be defining the left of your uh, range. So whenever start is moved to the left, this is your original range. If start is moved to the left, it means you are adding elements to your range. So whenever it moves to the left, you add elements to your set. Whenever it goes to the right, you are removing elements from your set. Similarly for end, when it goes to the right, and this is your original range, you are actually adding elements to your set. And when n moves to the left, you're actually shrinking your range, so you're removing elements from the set. Right? So that's how the behavior of the algorithm will be. Uh, if you're moving start to the left or right, corresponding elements get deleted or added. Okay? And we know that start and end have gone to L1 first. Now, start is in the correct position right now, but end is not in the correct position. It should be at R1. What we need to do is, uh, we need to check if R1 is greater than end. It means that end has to be incremented to get there. In our case, this is the scenario. Okay, So end has to be incremented, meaning elements need to be added to, the, uh, to your set. Okay, And had it been the other way around, had end been greater than R1, then we needed to decrement end and remove elements from the set. And what I mean by set? Well, you could use a set data structure which is going to have you know, uh, distinct elements only, but that's going to be very difficult to maintain. Reason being that elements are occurring multiple times and we are doing uh, add and delete operations. So you might delete an element which has occurred many times by just uh, you know, getting rid of the range for just one of those elements. So for example, if you had right here and your right got decremented, so you, you came here, you'll say remove 12, which will remove both elements 
from the set because uh, the set has just one distinct element. So things are going to get tricky. We are not going to keep a set data structure. Uh, we are going to be using an array of frequencies. So this is how it's going to happen. We have an array. Let's call it F. It's going to define frequencies. And let me just get some real estate now. This is how you're going to maintain the frequency of the arrays. You have for every possible element in this array a corresponding frequency. So from zero up to the maximum value that the array can have, you'll have corresponding frequencies. Uh, start and end are pointing at index three, which has a value 12. So this is how you initialize everything. First, you keep a count of the number of non-zero elements in your set, right? So count is initially zero because you don't have anything in your set. Now you added an element three to your set. So that means that you need to increment the frequency of something in your array, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to increment the frequency of the element at end by one, because that's what we just meant. Right, a of n is 12, frequency of that has to be incremented, this becomes 1. Okay. Now n is still not up to r1, so we are going to be keep pushing it to the left, or to the right, I mean. So whenever n goes to the right, you expand your range, which means you are adding elements. So n plus plus, same condition is 1, n is equal to 12 now n is equal to 12 now, same thing again, uh, we are going to be incrementing the frequency because our range expanded. So from 1 this becomes 2, okay. Now n is still not equal to r1, so increment n to 5, 16 is the element over there, so n got incremented, f of 16 plus plus tells us that we have a, we have this one here. Now, why did we have this variable count? Well, the count tells us the number of non-zero elements in this array. So, I, I forgot this part while doing this. Uh, it's whenever you have, whenever you are adding elements to your set, whenever you are incrementing the frequency, you also need to check for if the frequency of the element at that index. is equal to 1. If it is, then you increment count. So that would have happened once here, when it became 1. And right now you saw that uh, this became 1. So it happened twice. So count is now 2. Which makes sense, because we have 12 and 16 in our, uh, in our range. Which uh, distinct elements is just 12 and 16. Okay? Now, of course, you saw that this is still an ON operation for this particular uh, query. So even now we haven't improved on the complexity at all. But what we are going to do is uh, is is going to we are going to you know arrange our queries such that the complexity will reduce by itself. What we need to do is sort our queries by the left index and the right index. Okay. Now, when I mean sort by left index, it's a little special. Logically, what you're going to do is you're going to break your original array into blocks. Okay, uh, you're going to break the original array into blocks of size square root of n, because this is the optimal number that you'll get. If you do some uh, differentiation and all that, then you'll, you'll understand that square root of n is the best that you can take. And uh, then you're going to be taking not the left index exactly, but the block index at which left falls. Okay, so that would be L divided by root n. That will give you the index, at the, the block index at which left falls. And right will be sorted just by the index. You don't need to take any block index or anything. So these are the two parameters on which we'll be sorting our queries in ascending order. By doing this, what we are ensuring is that the amount of pointers which are moving are minimized. Okay, so our left index, we look at it later, 
let's look at how our right index is going to behave if we do this. So you sorted every query by left block index and if there was a tie then you use the right index in ascending order uh, to sort the queries. So essentially what happened? Well, let's come to a normal query. Let's say this is the block on which it's falling. Now this block is logical, you're not actually breaking the array into blocks or anything. So uh, let's say left is somewhere over here. And this is your remaining array. We have n here. Okay, and we have some more of the array on the left. For each query, your left index moves by at most root n for this block. For this specific block, it moves by root n. So each query is making it move by root n at most. For all the queries in this block, right is only, you know, we are only expanding our range to the right because we have sorted by right for all the uh, queries falling in this block. So right will only get incremented, end will only get incremented rather. Uh, and the worst case scenario is it starts somewhere over here and, and goes all the way up to end. So for this block, it travels n, uh, n uh, elements, so that is n. For the next block, it could do the same, so that would be n. So on and so forth for the next block also, so n. There are root n blocks, so that gives us n root n moves of the right pointer at most. Fine. n root n is the worst case scenario for right moving. What about left? We just said that left moves by root n at most for each query. So q root n, number of queries into root n is the moment for the left pointer. Overall complexity? is equal to q plus n root n common order of that. So this is a big improvement over the original complexity that we had of q into n. All right, by doing nothing, uh, essentially, we just uh, changed our way of thinking a little bit and also changed our uh, query, query ordering. Now, important to notice is that any update would have created serious issues because an update would have uh, not guaranteed that our query ordering is correct. Left and right is okay, but if there's an update in between, then you can't guarantee that the query answer will be the same later also. Okay, so more algorithm only works when there are no updates. Unless, and we are going to discuss this in uh, a different editorial, uh, unless you do some serious uh, mathematical stuff. So. We will get to that later. For now, understand that this type of algorithm works with uh, offline queries where there's, where, there's, where there's no updates, basically. I said that three times, yeah. So, uh, uh, this is your complexity. And there are a few operations which you need to know about for this problem. Anytime you need to update your uh, end pointer, you need to push it more to the right. And what you need to do is you need to do n plus plus of course, and you need to increment the frequency of the element at end by one. If you need to move your end pointer to the left, which could happen if your next query r2 is actually less than r1. If that happens, then uh, f of e of n needs to be decremented. And before that, you will be decrementing end, of course. Now, you might think that, how, can, how is that even possible? Right, the second right cannot be less than uh, the first right. So, remember, for the same block, left block index, the rights are in ascending order. But overall, there is no guarantee. If the first left block is at 1, and the second one is at 3, this could be 7, and this could be three, uh, 4. Right. We first uh, sort on the block index and then on the right index. Another doubt which could come up is uh, 
n is not a perfect square. So what's the, what's the left block index? Well, for a number like 10 that we have used, or this is actually 11, right? So n is equal to 11. Root of 11 is around 3. So you could use uh, block sizes of 3. That's okay. Which would break it into blocks of 0 to 2, 3 to 5, 6 to 8, and 9 to 10. Right, four blocks of different size. Um, you could technically also have appended a 0 here, or minus 1, minus 10,000 is also okay. Your queries will never get here, so you don't even care. And this is going to have an index of uh, 11 so that you get proper block sizes. Right, that's just an implementation detail. Uh, fine. So we, we talked about how end behaves. Let's also see how start behaves. So anytime start moves to the left, you're incrementing your range, you're, you're adding to your range. So if start moves to the left, meaning decrements, then f of a of start has to be added to your array. If start moves to the right, means you are shrinking your range. So f of a of start has to be decremented. And how do you output answers? Well, you have that variable count. So this is how count behaves. Whenever you are incrementing the frequency of an element, if that frequency is being incremented and it's equal to 1, then you need to increment count because you just added an element to your set. It's in, uh, Count became 1. If it becomes 2, 3, 50,000, doesn't really matter. You already added that element to your set, so that's okay. Whenever you decrement the frequency of an element, like here, or here, that's when you need to check if the frequency of that element is equal to zero now. If it is, then you need to decrement count because you just kicked out somebody from your set, right? And uh, yeah, all you need to do now is maintain the start and end pointers. That's pretty logical if, if start is less than uh, L of i, so if, if your start is somewhere over here and you need to get here, then you need to increment start. On the other hand, if start is greater than L of i, then decrement start. Yeah. Similarly for end, if end is uh, greater than R of i, then decrement end, otherwise increment end. Assuming, of course, that end is less than R of i. And once for all four of these conditions fail, so you know that start is equal to li and end is equal to ri, then just print out count for that range. And therefore, you have d query sort. So that's it for now. Mo's algorithm is something which is using simple operations and uh, simple techniques of sorting to bring down your complexity from this to this. And we'll be talking about updates in the Mo's algorithm, so in case you want to subscribe for that, you can subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you have any doubts or queries for this video, please put them in the comments below, I'll be happy to help. And uh, see you next time.